Hi, thanks for tuning in tonight. I've been wanting to put on my own show for a long, long time. And I've been doing all sorts of Mustang how-to videos, producing them and putting them out on there on YouTube for you guys. And this is going to be a show that I'm going to make basically how-to to you. And I think you guys are going to really enjoy this. Uh, I'm going to have different segments on this show that I'm producing. And a couple of things that I'll rattle off real quick is I'm going to have a how-to to you segment. It's going to be a how-to time where I'm going to come up with a little how-to video for you guys or a how-to uh, task that maybe even after I'm done with my show you guys can run out your garage and, and do the task on, on your Mustang that's sitting in your garage. You know there's nothing more enjoyable than working on your classic car or your Mustang. Well, almost. I mean there's a couple other things that are more enjoyable than that but pretty close. Mustangs are pretty cool to work on. Classic cars are cool to work on. So if I can relay my message and get my point across on how to fix your car, you guys are going to have a real big kick to do it and I'm going to have a lot of fun doing it myself. Um, so tune into my show for something like that. I plan to have some guests on, uh, either some, some of my customers that have their own ideas. Um, I plan to have some of the parts suppliers that, that we uh, get our parts from. Let's get those guys on here. Let's get them to ask some tough questions on how they make their parts. Where do they come from? Where are they spending their money on these parts? You know, it's nice that, that things are made in America. We all want to spend money here on our own homeland. And I think that's an important role that these parts makers should play when they're making these parts for our classic cars. So let's put their feet to the fire, ask them the tough questions on where their parts are coming from. Um, other things that we're going to cover is uh, different um, the way these parts fit and the way their finish is and things of that nature. Oh, and I'm not going to forget to answer my email questions. You know, every day I get so many people asking me different questions on either how to fix their cars or what their cars are worth or just so many things. And I try and answer every question I can. Um, I get here so early in the morning to answer my email uh, because it's just something I enjoy to do. So if you got a question, email me or give me a call. Pick up the phone, give me a call, and I'll, uh, I'll do what I can to give you an answer. Uh, so as a matter of fact, today I got a whole bunch of questions here that later on I'm going to rattle off and see if I can answer for you. Um, a couple of the other things that we're going to go through is, uh, you know, what's going on my, in my shop? Every week, I take in so many cars that we work on. You know, it's not all about doing full restorations. It's about maintaining these classic cars. And it's a matter of maybe just giving a guy a tune-up or putting a quarter panel on the car. So you guys are going to see what is going on in my shop and what we do on a weekly basis. I'll cover some different things. That's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, it's, I'm real excited about this, and you guys need to tune in for that one. The uh, other thing we're going we're gonna to cover is uh, we're going to cover some market values. You know, over the last couple of years, not only housing, but cars themselves have taken a little bit of a sluggish hit from this economy that we've had. And um, I get people asking me all the time, hey, you know, is my car worth what it was worth two years ago? Well, we're going to touch bases on questions like that. Uh, I write up appraisals here on these old Mustangs and classic cars and um, I'll be able to answer the tough questions when it comes to that. Everybody's got their own opinion on, on what a car is worth and where it's going to be going as far as its value. I'll be able to give you my take on it. Oh, and I'm not going to forget to, t to cover what these um, auctions are all about. You know, you can watch the Barrett-Jackson auction, there's the Russo and Steele auction, and there's a couple of other classic car auctions out there. And everybody sees their classic cars going for big, big money. And they want to know, hey, is that real? I mean, what is really going on there? How could a 65 Mustang six-cylinder coupe go for $25,000? Well, I'll tell you how that 65 Mustang coupe goes for $25,000 and what the real story might be behind that. Um, so that's going to be a good segment for us to cover, too. Um, I have a lot of parts suppliers. Uh, Scott Drake is, is a real good company that we're going to cover these guys here. I buy a lot of stuff from these guys. They make a quality part, but we're going to really see how their parts fit. 
Um, another company I deal with is California Pony Cars. They do a lot of cool things for the newer Mustangs. You know, they have a whole next generation line that's really up to date and some really cool modifications for your uh, newer Mustangs. Um, so, you know what? There's life beyond old Mustangs. We can drive around new Mustangs too and, uh, and enjoy them and, and, and consider those classics all also. Because they are future classics. If you maintain your car and you keep it in good working order, then over the years it's going to become a classic or it's going to maintain some sort of value. Anything that gets old becomes valuable. One thing I've done in the past is whenever I bought a car and I've made my payments over over the time period I should be making my payments um, I've kept it for the most part I've kept these cars once I'm done paying with them I keep them because I found when you go to trade them in they don't want to give you nothing for these things and so I'm thinking well rather than take five hundred dollars for the car that I've paid over these time period for I'll just keep it well, that's worked out pretty good for me because I have a fairly good collection of cars and now because I've kept them and maintained them, now they have some value. Um, <clears throat> fortunately, a few years ago, I had to sell my 63 Lincoln convertible. A lot of my local customers know that car because I show up a lot of car shows with it and um, my family and I had a really good time with that old 63, man. I mean, I had that thing for 20 years. But uh, this economy, the hard times we had of uh, December, a couple of Decembers ago, you know what? It was, it was down to paying some, some hard bills that, that need to be paid uh, or selling that car. And the unfortunate thing is that car was a, um, a casualty of this economy that we've all been going to. But it was there for me. I kept it. I maintained it. I, I made fourfold of what I paid for the thing. So in that 20 year period, that car made me four times the money that I paid for it. And I had all that enjoyment with it. I used to take my wife and kids out in it. We'd go for ice cream with the top down. It was a white 63 convertible. And uh, it was the same kind of car that, that uh, President Kennedy had as his personal car. Because um, presidents and dignitaries drove those things. And that's always what I told my kids. That we're driving in cars that, that rich people and presidents would drive around in. Um, so that was a lot of fun, but you know what? It was only a car. I had to sell it, and, and uh, in hindsight, I'm sad that I sold it. But you know what? Uh, I, I kept my business going, and that's the uh, that's what you got to do. So that's the way you need to think of your Mustang. It's not only a cool thing to have around, but it could also be used as a tool in the future if you get yourself in a little bind or the economy takes a downswing. You can take your Mustang and put it up for sale. You might not get the big bucks out of it, but if you've maintained it and you've kept it over a period of time, you'll certainly make more money back on it than what you've spent on it in the past. And all the enjoyment that you've gotten out of it. How do you put a dollar figure on the enjoyment that you get out of a Mustang or a classic car? Cruising around, your arm is on the, on the door like this and you got your hand on the steering wheel just checking things out. You know what? Ain't nothing like it, I'm telling you. Um, so. You're going to learn a lot of lessons on what I have to, to, to give you, and um, I think you're going to enjoy that. Um, the other thing that we're going to talk about is um, what my new website is all about. I'm putting together a new website here that some of you might be tuned in on called ClassicMustangTelevision.com. And that has come about because I got a lot of people that have been asking me, you know, you got all those videos out there, Chris. Uh, you're free with the information that you want to give. And um, why, are, why aren't you on television? Why aren't you doing anything? Well, you know, in the future, maybe that'll happen for me, either on Discovery Channel or Speed Channel or Power Block on Sunday morning. My kids are always watching the Power Block. Um, and maybe that'll come. But in the meantime, I've got to do my own thing, and that's to come up with my own television show. Uh, or internet show as this might be, and that's what we're trying out here. But anyways, my ClassicMustangTelevision.com website is all about the accumulation of how-to videos I've put together. I have a live webcam going in my shop uh, during the day. And um, 
what that does, it focuses in on my service side of the shop. It doesn't really go into the body shop or into the assembly area. My shop is broken down into about six different departments and six different areas in my building. Um, we got uh, the service side, which does mostly, uh, you know, of course, tune-ups and oil changes. We do all those minor things. But it'll also encompass doing power steering conversions and disc brake conversions and quarter panels and a floor pan job. Things that are mechanically and easily or relatively easily installed on the car will be on my service side. The body shop side, of course, is the side that's always dusty in there and you know it's, it's always got something going on that people just seem to love. Uh, most people that come into my place just go, Boy, I love the smell of the chemicals and things you guys use around here, the primer. And for some reason, people like that smell. For us, it's not that cool of a smell because we know what that, what that means, and that means it's not necessarily a good thing. So we take all the precautions we can to, uh, to make sure things are as healthy as possible for our employees. But um, anyways, in the body shop side, you're going to see where they're finishing off the body, uh, getting these things in primer, getting the preparation done inside all the nooks and crannies and getting these cars painted. That is an ongoing task when you're, when you're trying to get a, a, a car, a classic car or any type of car ready for paint and painted. And for you guys out there that have tried this in your own garage, you got to know what I'm talking about. You can, you can go on and on forever on getting something prepped for painted until you finally got to say, look, this thing's going to look good let me pull the trigger and get this thing done because there's always a nook there's always a cranny there's always a little wave there's always a little something that you think geez i gotta keep going so you get yourself to a level where you know it's just going to look good and uh, we're going to show a lot of that for you too but um, that's an exciting area another department in my in my company is the assembly area <clears throat> once the cars get painted then they'll go over to the assembly side and they don't just get the next day like sanded and buffed. We don't have that regular body shop analogy where in on Monday, out on Friday. That's fine for mom's minivan and dad's pickup truck that he uses every day and he needs it back as soon as possible because he's probably going to sell that and mom's probably going to get a new minivan in a couple of years. So it doesn't really matter whether the quality of work is going to last very long. It just has to look shiny almost just the day that, that it gets picked up. And then after that, one of the kids is going to take their bicycle and doink it, so it doesn't really matter. But with old cars and classic cars and these Mustangs, these things have to last. It's, it's almost like when, when we're done with our car that we do, these, these cars get taken home, and all they do is get looked at and critiqued. You call your buddies over, they come over, they walk around the car, they're looking at it. A lot of them are a little jealous of what you got going here, so they're like, hey, what about this spot here, and hey, what about that spot over there? So the car's got to look good now, and they got to last a long time in the future. Um, and a lot of our techniques have proven. That's the good thing about, about the, the business I have, being in business for over 30 years. We've been able to test a lot of things. We've been able to see whether they've worked. I get so many of my customers coming back for, for, for us to maintain their cars. And so we get to go back and take a look at the work we've done and say, geez, you know, this is holding up really well here. We must have done it right. The chemicals and the products we're using are really working out well. And the techniques we're using are really working out well. So that's a good thing from that standpoint, uh, from a longevity thing. But anyways, I got off track there. The assembly room, after the car gets painted, it'll sit in there probably for two, three, maybe as much as a month before the, the surface coat gets wet sanded. And after that wet sanding process happens, we'll even let the car sit another week to let the chemicals that are inside the paints and the um, clear coats we use, the solvents, um, get themselves out of there and evaporate. Because if you, if you buff it too soon, it doesn't hold its shine. It's, it's almost like fine wine. If it's, if it's opened up too soon, it tastes okay, but if you had let it go longer, it would have tasted better. Same thing here with body and paint work. The longer these 
uh, materials that we use can sit and cure, the longer they will last. Because if you put something on a car and then you rush it and you clear coat over it, well the stuff that's underneath will continue to shrink and evaporate and all it does is pull the clear coat or the color down with it. And now the thing that people look at, which is your paint job, is compromised. So you really need to slow down when you do an old car. Um, don't be in such a rush. That seems to be the, the thing that people tend to do is rush things. And hey, I'll be the first one to admit that as a kid, when I put my model cars together, I couldn't get that thing together fast enough. You know, my dad would buy me this Mustang or this, this Torino model that I would get. And the first thing I'd want to do is get the wheels and the axles on it and roll the chassis around. And next thing I'd do, I'd have to like glue things together. Well, at the end of the day, I might have had this thing together and it looked like something, but it wasn't as good as it would have been if I had taken it over a period of time. Uh, there's glue all over the plastic windshields. You know you guys out there that have built models like I have. You know, when you rush and put your little plastic windshield in on your model, you end up spilling the glue all over it and then that's the kiss of death for those things. You try wiping it off and it smears and you know, you need to take your time when you're doing things and classic cars is one of the biggest things you need to take your time doing. So when the car gets into my assembly room, We'll let it sit for a while, we'll do the sanding and buffing process, we'll get it to a level where we can start assembling the outside. The assembly process, oh my god, that's another thing that seems to take forever. I can't believe Ford was getting these Mustangs out as fast as they were. They made two million of them within the first couple of years that they made these things. And it's difficult for us to assemble a car in, in a couple of weeks, uh, nonetheless as fast as they assembled them. But they were dealing with brand new cars that don't get critiqued as much as something that's an old car. And of course they were dealing with brand new parts and brand new nuts and brand new bolts and brand new pieces, which allowed them to just quickly assemble things for the most part. It's not that way when it comes to putting an old car back together. You can't put them together as fast as you think you're going to do and have the window roll up and seal the way you want to do and have that door close without going clickety-clank and, uh, and have the door lock work and though that's the meat and potato kind of stuff right there that really needs to work well. For the most part it's an easy task to get a body shiny and painted. It looks good, it looks real good. But then let's open up that door, let's roll that window down. You see a lot of those shows on, you know there's a show that I've been watching every Wednesday night called Car Warriors. And I gotta hand it to these guys, man. They gotta get these cars modified and back together in 72 hours and then get judged by three guys that are really big in their field. One of them is George Barris. Uh, I own a few George Barris cars. And that guy, he knows his stuff, man. I'm telling you. But these guys gotta get these things done in three days. And it's not an easy thing to do. So if you notice at the end of that show, when these cars are getting critiqued, Look around the small things that they're putting together. Look at their headliners, how they're sagging. Look at the fit of a few things. You'll notice that they, they very rarely have glass in their cars because it's a whole other thing they don't have to deal with. They just chop the roofs off them and they're just roadsters. They're not meant to have a roof. They're not meant to have glass. That's a real nice shortcut to take. So you notice those kind of things. But when you're putting a car together, either for yourself or for somebody else, and in my case, my customers, you can't have that. Everything's got to work. Uh, when you do it yourself, I have a lot of customers ask me, well, why does it cost so much for you to put a window regulator in? Uh, well, the reason is because there's a lot of alignment issues behind that. There's a lot of things to do to it. And when we do it, it's got to be all it can be. A guy might say, well, I can do that at home, and that's fine. I mean, that's why I got my how-to videos is to teach a guy how to do it and do it the right way, or at least the way I've developed. But if you do it at home, you can stand back and look at it and say, hey, you know what, that's good enough. I'm fine with that. Well, we can't have that. There is no good enough thing here. Um, it can't be just good enough. It's got to be the way it's got to be for everybody to just walk up to the car and roll that window up, and it's got to work. Uh, when I take my wife out in my cars, 
man, she finds this, this, the dangest things on my cars. And I'll be like, well, how did you find that? Well, did you see this little screw over here is loose? And you know, why is this over here? I'm telling you, ladies, you see all these things that sometimes us guys don't, think, don't see. And that's a good thing, because you got to look outside the box when you do cars. You can't just be looking and focused at the center. You got to look outside the box, and ladies will do that for you. They'll walk up to a car, and you'll be like, looks pretty good, doesn't it, honey? And she'll be like, well, yeah, but what about this over here? What about that over there? It's like, well, what are you looking at that for? I'm trying to show you this here. They see things that are so neat and teach you a lesson. So the next time when you bring your wife out in the garage and show her, honey, see what I've done, you kind of look around that and say, okay, well, is, is she going to see this little thing over there? Is she going to see this little thing over there? That's the mindset you got to have when you do cars, is what is somebody else going to look at besides what I'm looking at here uh, that they're going to spot that's going to almost kind of make you look bad, uh, that, that uh, is more, seems like it's more important to them than it is to you. And it's not, it's just that they happen to spot that thing. So those are the kind of attention to details that we at my shop, Mustang Restorations, has always strived to look out for and has always strived to do. If we've made a mistake in the past or if I've done something wrong, it's not because we've like overlooked it, we've said, you know what, I don't care about that. It's, it's because we've just missed it or because of the part issue or because of the fit issue. There's, there's a reason behind it we've done it. Uh, we probably know that it's like that and then I tell my customer, hey, you know, this all came out good here, here, but, you know, this thing here just doesn't quite work as well as I was hoping it would work. Um, I had a customer drop off a 69 Fastback. Beautiful car. Acapulco Blue. Uh, he had a stroker in it. It was a 390 stroked out to a 418. This thing sounded like it wanted to do tens in the quarter mile, man. I mean, it sounded fast. But uh, anyways, he was concerned because the door... When he opened it and closed it, number one, it closed a little hard, and, and then it stuck out at the bottom. And now the car is painted, which means that you only, you're really limited on how much you can do when the car is painted, because you can't like over pull and over push a body panel, because you're going to chip paint, you're going to make paint work, and, and you can't do that. You certainly don't want to do that. Um, <clears throat> so there's different techniques that you can do. So this way, when it gets to the point, the car is painted, you've overcome those kind of things. So anyways, the short answer to that is we've made some small adjustments on the door for him. And he's going to have to live with a few things, unfortunately, because it's almost too late. And as he wants to get involved in paint being broken up and repaint the side of his car, some of those things are not going to be fixed. So there's some lessons to be learned there, which those are things I'm going to touch bases with you also on as far as what to do and what make sure you do before you paint a car. A lot of times you're going to want to just assemble the whole car before you almost paint it. Not assemble the whole car, but certainly pre-fit a lot of things that might come into play as far as a question goes once the thing is painted. A lot of customers will say, you know, you seem to be taking a little bit longer on my car than I was hoping for. What's going on with that? Well, up front, it seems like we're taking a little bit longer because the car isn't getting painted in a week or a month's time. Because before we paint it, we've taken these new emblems out of the boxes and we've drilled the holes and we've pre-fitted those things. We've put windows in and we've taken windows out. We've put doors on and taken doors off. We've done all those kind of things. So once the car is painted, we can just take those horses that we've put aside that have fit that car and just put them right into place. So things actually move faster on the back end because you do a little preventive fitting in the front end. You don't see the progression as fast or it doesn't seem like you're progressing as fast because you've done all these things first. But on the back end when you go to assemble it, of course now things go boom, 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 boom and uh, you, can, you can put things together a little faster. Even though you still want to take your time, make sure you take your time on whatever you do with these things. Whether it comes to putting together classic cars or putting together those, uh, those curtain rods that you, your wife wants you to hang at home, which I've never 
been a good guy with curtain rods. I hate that kind of job, but I do it and I get past it. And sometimes that's what you do. But we're going to have a lot of different things on this show. I think you guys are going to enjoy it. And um, uh, these are things we're going to do. Um, I have a couple of questions, email questions, that I thought I'd answer real quick. And uh, let's get to them. John1482 um, wanted to know, on his 68 Mustang, it'll start in neutral, but if he puts it in park, it won't start in park. What's with that? Well, John, the short answer to that is there's an apparatus on older cars and newer cars called a neutral safety switch. And what that allows you to do is to ha have the car start in both neutral and park, but not start in reverse or drive. The last thing you'd want to do is forget the car is in reverse or drive for whatever reason, and then you start it and the car goes flying in reverse and, God forbid, maybe run somebody over. Uh, so they put this switch in there to prevent somebody from starting the car in a gear that it shouldn't be started with. Well, what's happened with your car, John, is that the connection when it's in park has been lost for whatever reason, probably because of age. The switch is underneath the car on the side of the transmission, so it gets a lot of road debris, it gets a lot of oils that happen. It just is not in a good spot from an environmental standpoint to be a long-lasting thing. So if you go to a different, if you go to some different uh, parts websites, I think Scott Drake carries the neutral safety switches for those things. You put one on. I tell you what, I'm going to write down to actually put a how-to video together on neutral safety switches. Um, it's actually something that somebody could do at home. So that's a, <clears throat> that's a real good question because now I'll put together a how-to video for you on that. Um, and um, one other question I'm going to answer here is um, I got a guy here, GT1968. He's got uh, a headlight problem. He's going for 15, 20 minutes, and all of a sudden the headlights come on, headlights go off, headlights come on, headlights go off. I had that happen to me once on, uh, on my Mustang limo, as a matter of fact. And what that is, is inside your headlight switch, there's a circuit breaker of, of sorts in there, because the headlights are not fused at all. So inside the headlight switch, there's a circuit breaker that if it senses some sort of an issue, it'll shut down the current going to the headlights. Usually over time, the headlight switch itself goes, goes awry, and if you replace your headlight switch, which if you look on my how-to videos, I got a video on how to put in headlight switches on Mustangs. Go to my uh, website, uh, and you'll see where that headlight switch video is. It's a real simple task. Uh, you can do it, I'm telling you. Um, and then um, another question I got here is um, uh, gas gauges. A lot of old cars in general, and the Ford Mustangs are, are no uh, exception, is that the gas gauge tends to uh, not work, or it's real erratic. And the, the fix to that is usually the thing in the gas tank. It gets heavy, it gets weighted, and uh, it just doesn't work for whatever reason. So keep the emails coming in. And, um, and I'll answer them all I can. This show here is a little bit of a short show. I plan on having a half hour show, um, but I'm going to cut this one a little short so I can get to work on my next show. So keep in touch with me. Keep the emails coming in. Give me a call. Go to my website, mustangrestoration.net or classicmustangtelevision.com and you're going to start seeing all sorts of cool stuff. And keep tuning in on my show because remember, this doctor, the doctor of restoration, is always in, and I'm here for you guys. So thanks for watching tonight, and we'll see you next week.